you know, David Aronofsky used to say, he's dead now, a long time AA member. David A. would say, the reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty. <laughs> Doesn't have anything to do with AA, you know, or alcoholism or the disease of alcoholism. And, uh, and so, you know, it just got, it got a lot worse. I finished SMU, got a degree, and got a DWI. I'm working for this little software company, and, you know, by the time I'm in my mid-20s, you know, I don't go to happy hour with them anymore because I've just made a, you know, just a total fool out of myself one too many times. Uh, you know, if I go to happy hour on Friday night, I don't come to work on Monday morning, you know, and I don't, I don't know. I still don't know that it's that first drink. And for a guy like me taking that first drink that I have absolutely no control over where I'm going to go, or what I'm going to do. And then I'm not going to stop until I get stopped. Something stops me. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hey everybody, that was Mr. Jimmy D's voice that you heard at the beginning of this uh, episode. And Jimmy D is here from the Dallas, Texas area. Uh, he has a great sense of humor, which you will hear once you begin listening to the uh, episode. Uh, he is very articulate in how he explains both his story and his love of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program, and he works tirelessly for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous here in the Texas area and throughout the nation, actually. And so, anyway, you're really going to enjoy his story. But before we get started, this episode is brought to you by Caitlin. Caitlin went to our website, SoberSpeak.com, clicked on the Donate tab, and made a contribution. Thank you so much, Miss Caitlin, for your generous contribution. This episode is for you. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, announcements here and some listener feedback. Uh, if you, by any chance, uh, enjoy this podcast and you would be interested in possibly uh, moderating a uh, Facebook group, maybe Instagram or something like that, uh, reach out to me personally, John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com. Uh, this uh this podcast, in a very good way, has taken on a life of its own. I did not even anticipate, and uh, there's just a lot of ideas and things that I have that I want to get done with the show, but I just, I personally don't have a time, this, the time. This is a uh, avocation, not a vocation for me, and uh, so if you'd be interested in something like that, great. Reach out, and we can have a conversation. Also, if you have any questions, any of you have any questions, you want me to ask the guest or possibly something that I can answer for you. Uh, I want to hear about success stories as well, maybe milestones you've hit, anything you're struggling with, please, please reach out either by that email, john at soberspeak.com, or you can reach out to us via uh, voice. Uh, if you pause this episode and you look at the show notes for uh, not only this episode, but all the other episodes, you will see something there that says, leave a message. Uh, and you can click on a link there. It goes right to something called Speak Pipe. And you can leave us a message. It goes 90 seconds long. But if you're long-winded, you can just call in twice or three times, I guess, right? And I'll just uh, uh, splice it all together. So I want to go into the listener feedback that we have had since last time we spoke. And... Um, Listener feedback goes like this. First of all, Bjorn from Sweden wrote in. And, you know, I said this last time as a joke, 
but we had another uh, listener write in from Sweden. And uh, as a joke, I said, hey, is everybody in Sweden named Bjorn that is male? And uh, <laughs> and here we have another Bjorn. And it is another Bjorn. Uh, and, you know, and for, if you're listening in Sweden, I'm sure you think to yourself, is everybody in America named John? So... <laughs> Anyway, Bjorn from Sweden writes in and he says, I am 51 years of age and living in Stockholm. I had a a long relapse that lasted four to five years and I'm back in the program since one month ago and that'll be 30 days tomorrow. Congratulations, Bjorn, on your 30 days. I understood pretty early that I was having trouble in many aspects of my life that I, and that I cured that with alcohol and later other mind-altering substances as well. The first contact I had with the program was when I had a treatment in 2001. After that, I had a number of relapses. Guess I had not reached my absolute bottom yet. Well, I broke out in handcuffs this summer after allegedly assaulting my girlfriend's daughter with a bar stool. How appropriate. So this was pretty much it. I've turned into someone and something that I'm not. Your pod is exactly what you say it is, a meeting between meetings. It puts me in a place where I get back my life into perspective, and I guess it's good for keeping my ego in check. Your podcast is funny, extremely funny at times. I need to laugh. Educational as well and spiritual. On days when I'm down and life's not going the way I want it to, ego, listening to you and your guests can really make a difference for sure. I'm on the fourth step now, and I'm doing pretty fantastic. I do what my sponsor tells me to do, including praying, and so far, I've not even had the idea of putting putting mind-altering substances into my system. A true miracle. Not quite sure why it works this time, but I have my suspicions. I do what my sponsor tells me to do, including praying every morning and if necessary during the day. And I thank God at night. Guess what? I stopped praying before my relapses I had earlier in my life. This time I feel safe, loved, and part of this fellowship by the grace of God. So with all my heart, thank you and God bless. Peace, Bjorn. Well, peace and God bless you, Bjorn, thank you so much for your uh, vulnerability, your openness, and I'm glad you seem to be on the right track. Keep listening to that sponsor. Kathy Kay writes in from Northern California. She says, John, I love your podcast in the interview format of Sober Speak. Most people speaking in front of crowds get a little bit anxious. Your friendly and yet direct style seems to put them and me, quote, at ease. I'm sober seven years. I attend meetings in Northern California. I have recommended Sober Speak to friends and sponsors again and again. It's truly a meeting between meetings, exclamation point, Kathy Kay. Thank you, Kathy Kay. You know, I'm going to read a couple more uh, other, uh, some more feedback here, but I just want you guys to know that... This really, really puts gas in my tank when I'm able to hear from you. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I mean, you know, I just sit here with my mic talking to a, uh, um, into this microphone. And I think, you know, who's hearing this out of here? How are they hearing it? You know, is it impacting them? And when I get this feedback, it absolutely, uh, makes my light shine. I sure do appreciate it. My light in me honors the light in all of you. Brenda from Australia writes in, Hi, John. I love your podcast. I'm in Australia. I particularly love your laugh. It cracks me up. (laughs) Three exclamation points. You mentioned in one about a particular meditation that you listen to on the Insight Timer on the Insight Timer app. Could you please share the name with me? Yes. So this is I've got this question several times. So if you listen to the Insight Timer app, I found a guy. It was an 11-step meditation prayer, I think is what it was. His name is Randy F. 
A-H-R-B-A-C-H. And it was just the right thing for me at the right time. Uh, it may speak to you, it may not, but it was a, it was a meditation that really uh, impacted me at that time in my life. So thanks for writing in from down under in Australia. I appreciate it. It's interesting. I had a couple people mention my laugh. I've had other people write in and say, would you quit laughing while these people are talking? So... I guess you can't please all the people all the time. Uh, I'll just continue to do to do the best I can. Caitlin writes in, and Caitlin says, "Thank you so much for continuing to host this podcast!" Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Well, I would say thank you, Caitlin, for continuing to listen to this podcast. It sure does mean the world to me. And so, this week on Instagram, by the way, on Instagram, I'm at. Uh, Sober speak, all one word, S-O-B-E-R-S-P-E-A-K. I would love for you to come by and follow me. I answer direct messages, uh, put out comments a lot. I put out uh, uh, types of comments and I'll reply to the comments. And uh, anyway, I put out there this week, I said, what is your definition of humility? Because I had been to a meeting on humility, and I noticed that many people had many definitions of humility and, and what it meant to them and how it impacted their life. And uh, so I decided to post it on Instagram. And Aaron said, perpetual quietness of the heart. And I thought that was an incredible definition. AJ said, for me, I think of the attempt at tolerance of others, and especially myself, not trying to be better than or less than, just be. I used to always try to be humble and practice humility with my own willpower, and I wanted to be the absolute best at it. But for now, I'm starting to be able to accept attempting my best at things, but not trying to be, quote, the best. I really relate to that, AJ. Uh, thanks for your comments. I sure do appreciate it. And now we are on to Mr. Jimmy D. Enjoy. Okay, everybody. So we are sitting here with Mr. Jimmy D. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I always say this. Uh, I've been looking forward to this interview, but I, I genuinely have been looking forward to this interview. Uh, to this uh, uh, episode today, I saw uh, Jimmy speak once at a group here in Dallas, a Prosper group, in fact, uh, and he did an absolutely fantastic job. So I want to get him here on Sober Speak. So, Jimmy, I'm going to let you uh, introduce yourself, give your sobriety date if you wish, uh, and say any sort of general comments about yourself that would you would like to on the beginning of this. So I am uh, I'm Jimmy D, and I'm alcoholic. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous since August the 25th, 1997, and, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I am, uh, I'm glad to, uh, to be able to participate. I've done a couple of firsts in the last two or three months, first in my sobriety. What's that? Uh, one of them was I did a um, Skype talk oh, really? with a group in Palm Beach, Florida. Oh, so like you were the guest speaker for that group. That's right. Via Skype. Oh, really? Via Skype. No, I've not even heard of that. Um, they're, they're a very small group. It's a stag meeting, probably maybe eight or ten guys. They're all uh, active uh, general service, uh, you know, type A members, right? So they've got, a, they've got a lot of three legacy experience. So what they're trying to bring in, at least for the first number of weeks, are people like I served as past delegate. The woman who recommended me was a past delegate from Colorado. So, you know, we tell our recovery story, but they want an emphasis on after sobriety, how we've been involved in, for lack of a better term, the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the, the yeah. unstructured structure of <laughs> right. AA, the, right? The and, uh, which, is a, which is a unique, you know, obviously we have our, uh, our own brand of, of uh, you know, the upside down triangle, right? right. Where the groups are at the top. And, and, uh, and so, so you take, you know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes at the end, um, talk a little bit about traditions. And, uh, and so I, uh, I just use my laptop and, uh, and you know, their, their it guru, right. Got us on, uh, it was akin to Skype. It wasn't really Skype that we used like zoom or exactly. Something. But the nice thing about it is obviously I could see them, right. And they could see me. 
and uh, but it was first time, right? Um, I've never been on a podcast before, mm-hmm. either either as an AA member or not as an AA member. <laughs> so uh, you know, moving into the what did we say, rocketing into the nineties, right? <laughs> right. So there you have it. I don't, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm ancient, but <laughs> you know, I have to. The men I sponsor, the ones that are you know under the age of forty, mm-hmm. they teach me a lot about. <laughs> how stuff works right and i work for a software company (laughs) and i have for 34 years right so we would think i would be a little bit more inclined to uh you know like uh i mean i thought i understood bluetooth uh several years back i had a car before the car i've got now and and uh i was sure it was an audi and i was sure that you had to buy like a, a phone cradle type device in order to have the you know the car ready for the cell phone, right? (laughs) Right. And so we were riding up to Lake Murray, men's conference in the spring I Uh go to every year. I'm riding with a guy from Denton that I've sponsored for several years. And, you know, I'm talking on my phone. (laughs) And he said, why don't you just use Bluetooth? And I said, because I don't have one of those earpieces, right? I'm thinking Bluetooth is the the earbud, (laughs) right? So uh, he said, looked at me and he thought, you know, how far do I go with this? Right. There's got to be a little respect. I don't want him to know, you know, he's at the second grade. You know, he hasn't started reading yet. So uh, so what he did for me is he hit a couple of buttons, you know, on the radio, paired my phone and, uh, you know, I just snarled at him. But I'm I was excited. That's great. <laughs> Oh, welcome to the yeah, age of yeah, technology. Thank God there are no technology requirements to be a member of AA. <laughs> That's right. You know, I appreciate the ebook. I'm all about the ebook. <laughs> Not so much about the ebook that got to got, got to the world before the AWS ebook, right? Yeah, right. Because it was out there before, right? But that's a story for another day. Losing the copyright on the book Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> because we were busy, you know, doing something else. That's great. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. All right. Well, let let's let's uh, dive into Jimmy D's story here a little bit. So I know you grew up in Dallas. Is I that did right? the Dallas I did. area. I, I should did. say. Um, so take me back. I mean, you know, what do you want us to know about, you know, your, your growing up and, you know, what kind of a background you had, you know, what, uh, what kind of personality you have? And why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? I would say, um, you know, we think, uh, we, we try to go back when we tell our stories in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's interesting because now for the past, I don't know how many years, it's a, it's a, um, it's a wonderful way to, you know, revisit things that I wouldn't necessarily think about when I'm driving somewhere in the car or, or uh, you know, there are certain uh, things that bring back memories for me, right? The scent of a perfume make me think about my mother or, you know, those kind of things. And, and they were, they were troublesome before sobriety. I mean, there were some, but not about who they were as per, as people, right? My mother was from an old Louisiana family, South Louisiana uh, cultured. Uh, they thought she was insane to come to Dallas, to go to SMU. I mean, they just could not believe that she would go West, especially to a state like Texas and try to achieve higher education. I mean, they just did not believe that was possible. You know, if Sophie Newcomb wasn't good enough, you went East, you know, to school. And, uh, and so she had come up here to Dallas, go to school at SMU. And, uh, and she met my dad. My dad was one year, uh, on faculty of sorts at Southern Methodist University by mistake, uh, not an academician, not trained in any way to stand at the head of a classroom, uh, but he had advanced degrees and they were in limbo for a geology professor and he taught geology for one year at Southern Methodist University. And, uh, and so that's how they met. She was the art history major who obviously made a grave error in programming and found herself in a geology class. <laughs> and that's how they got together. And uh, and so, you know, the year after that, they 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 married, they engaged, she graduated, they engaged, they married. So early memories. So, you know, I had k- friends around the neighborhood. You know, we, um, I grew up in, you know, really smack dab in the middle of Lakewood, right at the head of Swiss Avenue. That old house is still there. It's probably got a plaque on it by now. You know, old 
monster looking brown brick house with a green tile roof, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but you know, there were families that had been in that part of the city for eons, mm -hmm. right? So fairly simple to integrate yourself into whatever people were doing. Um, and I mean, I was not socially awkward, but I was bookish from the, probably from the, from the very beginning. My mother was very smart. She was well-read. When I was a little boy, we'd play Word of the Day. I mean, I'd be four or five years old, and we her game was Word of the Day, and she'd teach you a word, right? And then that night at dinner, you should try to use the word, oh. right? Um, my dad traveled a lot. I mean, he was home, but he'd be gone. It was just really little two two or three day trips, but they seemed extended when you know when you're small when you're small and uh my was mother he was traveling for business he traveled for business he had a company they shot seismic back then which was you know there were all kinds of things that were fairly new technology in the in the mid to late 60s i was born at the tail end of 64 and and uh so by this is probably 19 early 1968 mid-1968. I remember my mother loved cars, and I loved to ride around. The, she just liked to ride around the car, right? Everything was a convertible then. I mean, you could get any model in a convertible, <laughs> and she had a, I think it was either a Oldsmobile 98, or it was some form of Cadillac. You know, it was a mile long. You know, the car wouldn't fit in the driveway. You know what I mean? It was a mile long, and, uh, and I just loved, you know, she'd call it the tuna clipper. We'd get in the tuna clipper and ride downtown and <laughs> The, so, I mean, tuna clipper? the tuna clipper. I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> I'm hoping that means a boat of some sort, right? Oh, okay, gotcha. But yeah, it must have been some some sort some sort of a, a boat, and uh, and so I mean, I, I you know, life was good. Uh, you know, we didn't have loud voices in my house. We didn't have breaking glasses, and we didn't have squealing tires in the driveway. And for all intents and purposes. It was happy. Brothers and sisters? None. Just me. Yeah. We're the same. Yeah. I'm an only child. Yeah. So, you know, that brings its own set of circumstances, I guess, probably, you know, spoiled a little too much or <laughs> maybe not enough or, you know, certainly sometimes you feel like you're singled out, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Certainly nobody else to blame anything. That's on, right. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it was, it, 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 that was all good. And then, you know, th things happened. They're just consequences of human existence. For whatever reason, when I was about four years old, you know, my dad left, right? And uh, and I don't know, you know, what, what uh, you know, kind of burns into the impression of a, of a young boy. One of the benefits of Alcoholics Anonymous, sponsorship in Alcoholics Anonymous, is you realize that that uniqueness, whatever you, you believe is unique, can, ne can never be. You know, uh, I was coming back from Austin yesterday. I don't want to... You know, I'm tangential, right? So I'll That's okay. just keep me from yeah, spinning. No, no, no. You go the... off on tangents. We're good. I like tangents so here. So one, one of the things that I was taught when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous is, you know, we share one another's experiences. So, you know, my repository of experience continues to grow, not just with the men I sponsor, but my fellow members in my home group. There's almost no situation that hasn't already been lived through or visited by another sober AA member. Uh, some of those things are not within AA's purpose. So Alcoholics Anonymous as a society is not in a position to address that particular topic, whatever it happens to be. And this young man is sponsored by a man that I sponsor. And so in the course of his fourth and fifth step with my guy, he has a huge resentment against God because his mother died of cancer when he was 12. And, uh, and so Mikey, my guy, sent his guy to me. So we spent about an hour and a half on the phone when I was on the highway coming back from Austin yesterday. And I told him what my experiences had been. You know, my father left. My mother was a single parent for a year. And uh, and then the ma a man came into her life, which was a huge deal. She was devout Catholic, went to Mass every day. Uh, I'm, you know, a lapsed Catholic. I mean, there's not anything wrong with Catholic religion. And I'm obviously not going to spend any airtime talking about Catholicism because I'm not in a position to do that. Plus it's obviously has nothing to do with what we're doing today. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you that marriage was a sacrament. Marriage was forever. And, uh, and he left and I've never known. And you know, I drank out of a whole bunch of stuff for a long, long time, try to figure out 
what that might have been. And, uh, and I know today that that probably destroyed my mother for a period of time, regardless of what that circumstance or those circumstances looked like. But, uh, but you know, she was a woman of great fortitude and, uh, and a lot of uh, inner strength and, and certainly spiritual uh, resolve. And so we had a year where we were just her and me. And about the time that I started school, um, she met this guy. And, uh, you know, he uh, was this big, tall, 6'3", curly, black-headed, lamb chop sideburns, you know, <laughs> dressed in black. Lamb chop sideburns. Oh, amazing, you know? <laughs> right? Amazing guy. Yellow Fairlane 500 convertible, glass packs on the back, you know, the rebel, <laughs> right? And, uh, and she fell in love with him, right? And it took a year, about a year and a half. You know, all the, I would say, all the loose ends, right? You had to marry in the church. My mother's world, you married in the church. So you had to get everything done, whatever that happened to be. You know, I was just kind of like the third wheel in the deal. But, uh, you know, that, uh, we became a family. And when we became a family, you know, he segued in the role of husband and father, gentle soul, big man, but just the biggest heart. And, uh, and so, you know, I don't remember feeling any different than either. Um, when I was eight, so about three years into that marriage, you know, my stepdad was a stockbroker, so he had a potential to open a big office and make a lot of money in South Louisiana and Lafayette. Now, my mother was not a Cajun girl. You know, she was a Southern Louisiana girl. There's a difference. There is a huge difference, and uh, and not in necessarily in a bad way, but in temperament, in temperament and demeanor, just they could be from other opposite ends of the earth. But she was excited about the South Louisiana part, right? I mean, you know, she had spent she, per her her uh, explanation or or uh, commiseration. Um, you know, those women, people come in our house and hear her talk and ask her where she was from. And she'd say, I'm from Metairie, Louisiana. And she said, I came up here to go to school against everyone's better judgment. And she said, I've spent way too much time in the North to my mother, Dallas, <laughs> the Texas, the North. <laughs> right. And, uh, anyway, so we went to Lafayette for a year. Great year. Now I have distinct and fond memories of all of that. You know, because you would think, okay, first time to really move away from, you know, the kids you've known pretty much since birth. Did you feel awkward? Did you feel out of place? With the exception of the fact that they talked funny, right? And they did talk funny. Mm -hmm. And their last names all ended in O, right. Thibodeau and Arsenault and Flo and Mo. <laughs> you know, it's just kids, right? <laughs> Run the neighborhood. Um, anyway, so my stepdad's mom, my grandmother, had uh, flown to Lafayette pick me up, bring me to Dallas for the summer. And, uh, you know, it was 1973. We, did, we didn't have any laws about anything. She got on the plane with me that morning. I mean, I remember that. I remember the smell of her perfume that morning. Mm. And, uh, and I'd never been away from her, maybe an overnight or two. And, uh, and she said, oh, we're going to go to Europe. I'm going to send you postcards. I'll call you as often as I possibly can. You're going to have such a good time with your grandmother in Dallas. Summer will be over before you know it. So we came to Dallas. And, uh, you know, the next morning there were a bunch of people in my grandmother's house and chaos of sorts. And, uh, and my grandmother said, you know, your mother's had an accident. We've got to go to Lafayette. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, you know, what, I don't, what's the big deal? I mean, all these people, uh, anyway, we went on the next T Texas international flu. Then we went down to Lafayette and we got the Our Lady of Lords hospital in Lafayette, Louisiana. And, uh, and I'd wait, they'd leave me in a waiting room in front of the hospital and go down a hallway and go in a room. And, and, you know, we did that day after day and, um, we get in the car at night, it'd be late at night. And, you know, my, my dad, my stepdad wouldn't talk and my grandmother didn't talk. And, you know, if there was one of her nieces or nephews or several that were down there, you know, it's just silence. I remember the silence. And we did, I don't know, seven or eight days of that. And, you know, I had to pass time. I mean, again, we laugh about technology, but in 1973, it didn't exist. And, uh, and so they had these square old, that was old building. They, I think it's gone now. They had these square ceiling tiles, and you'd count these dots in the tiles. I'd count those dots, those dots in those acoustic tiles. 
just to pass the time. And, uh, and you know, I'd lose the number. I'd get up a certain point, I'd lose the number. And uh, I'd look down the hallway, and somebody'd come out of a room. And I'd think, well, they're coming to get me. Because if I can hold her hand or whisper in her ear, I can, you know, I can fix it. I knew I could. And uh, anyway, um, I don't know. We did that at least a week. And uh, they sent a priest up the hall, and uh, he sat down next to me and gave me a little prayer card and, and uh, told me to think good thoughts about my mother. And that's why he let me know she, she'd passed away. Uh, right after she'd left me at the Lafayette Airport, something or somebody ran her off the road, and nobody knew then what happened. Nobody knows now, and, uh, and she didn't survive. Uh, but the, uh, I, I would say that, you know, the, the key component of that it relates to, as it relates to sobriety and my membership in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, was that she's the most God-fearing person I'd ever known. Uh, and she surrendered to that power in her building on a daily basis. And, uh, and I was a little boy, but I am certain today uh, that I filed away for future reference the fact that if you got too close to that power, it would destroy you. Uh, and it uh, wrecked the lives of people around you that loved you unconditionally because I saw it happen. Mm. Uh, my real father didn't make himself known, and uh, we came back to Dallas, and uh, we had a ranch in Glen Rose, south of Fort Worth. Mm. And so my stepdad went down there, and I moved in with his mother, went back to my old elementary school, uh, so he called on the weekends, asked me how school was going, if I'd hooked up with my old friends. And, you know, we'd hang up the phone and I'd think, you know, I was f fairly intelligent. And, uh, you know, I, I had a sense of, you know, kind of like what the temperature was. And, and I thought, you know, he should be here with us, you know, because he's my dad. And I'm living with his mother. Uh, my grandmother was the youngest of nine children. And there were five girls in that family. They all lived to be at least 90 years old, and they talked every day, every day for decades and decades and decades. And I'd eavesdrop on our conversations. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, he just needs time. I remember distinctly those conversations, too. She'd say, he just needs time. His heart's broken. He misses her so terribly. But that land will give him strength. And I know he loved that place. I remember going down there on the weekends before we moved to Lafayette. He loved that place. My grandmother said, he loves that land and that land will give him strength. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's what we did. And, uh, and you know, 11 months after my mother died, my stepdad had committed suicide and living in that ranch house, my grandmother's only child. And, uh, and you know, I was angry. Mm -hmm. I was angry. And, uh, and, you know, you, human beings, I mean, you know, we step through a process. I've been through it many times. I'm sure you've been through it as well. And, and, uh, and you know, these were, not, these were not people who were adverse to a spiritual condition. Um, the, the, you know, they were not atheist, nor agnostic, nor disinterested in some spiritual way of life. In fact, the opposite. In the course of the next, you know, few weeks or few months— different occurrences, certainly through the initial funeral, the burial and all those other things. And, you know, people come up to my grandmother and they'd say, you know, God doesn't give you more than what you can handle. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was only nine years old, but I was going home with her and they weren't. And I thought, you have no idea. You have no idea. And it made me angry. It made me angry. Um, my real father Again, not in the picture. I uh, obviously had godparents. I was a Catholic child, had children of their own. So, you know, the person that I brought with me when it came to Alcoholics Anonymous, because everybody brings at least one, the person that loves them unconditionally, right, was my stepfather's mother, my grandmother. She raised me. I mean, she said, I love the boy and I loved his mother. And that's, you know, how we started out, so to speak, right? And uh, you talk about being an only child. You're an only child. When things like that have happened, your family has resources, you're sorely overcompensated. I mean, people don't know what else to do, but if you want a pony, you need a pony. You know, you want a car at 15, you get a brand new car at 15. And, uh, and that has nothing to do with alcoholism. 
but it has everything to do with the sense of entitlement that I brought with me when I came into AA at 32. I was a 32-year-old child when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm going to tell you that I was above average in intelligence, but I was nonetheless a child. Um, so we, you know, we like to get drunk in AA, right? We love the stories. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for a drink for a number of different reasons, but not necessarily because I am so, what we say, maladjusted to life as much as when I get drunk for the first time at 15, at Papagayo Disco on Greenville Avenue in 1978. I remember Papagayo <laughs> Disco, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my God. And way you out remember Circle it. Disco? Oh, where was that? Oh, it was down, oh, I, I know, I'm, uh, Northwest Highway. And, oh, 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 in the circle, yes. like where the Circle yeah, Grill was. Exactly I never got all the way over there, yeah. but I got to Zebo <laughs> and I got to those places that over by Bachman. There were some places yeah. over by yeah. Bachman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but my world was very small <laughs> at that particular point in time. And I'd gotten this new Firebird because I turned 15. Oh. I got a hardship driver's license. There was a senior guy, Woodrow. Okay. where I was in high school, who was kind of a leader of a the social pack, right? <laughs> and they found out I had resources, and they were going to avail themselves of my resources. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, have the beer bust at my house kind so of thing. Just, so I can go back. So you've talked about the resources a couple of times. Did, did the resources come from, like, uh, uh, insurance money or something that came from? No, no, no. Or? My family had money. My, okay. my mother's family had a lot of land money gotcha. and a lot of development money. Gotcha. And, uh, and my grandmother, they were farmers, really, um, her family, uh, but all around Wiley and up to Farmersville and then come over to Plano and, and, uh, and they had some, they had the sense to at least hold on to some of that for a long, long time. And then my, I mean, my grandmother would tell you she's gone now, but she married very, very well. Gotcha. Yeah, she married well, and uh, and she helped him grow what he already had. So, I mean, you know, but we were not... Okay, so just segue back into my grandmother again. My grandmother always said, you know, there's money, and then there's money. <laughs> so this was just money. <laughs> right. <laughs> I gotcha. This wasn't like, right. you know, call and get the jet ready money. Right. There's a difference between rich and wealthy. Well, Bill, Bill Gates is wealthy. Right. And some right. of us have money. Yeah. And yeah. it was, but always a sense of community. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and I, I, and I think that is so not anonymous, right? To spend a lot of time with, with a particular demographic or as far as, you know, uh, upbringing or where you come from. Because I've sponsored, I've sponsored men of character that have really come from absolutely nothing mm. god develops character mm. uh you know they they the 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 the, 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 con, the the continuum in their early life even though everything was absolute chaos was the fact that whereas i ran away from any sense of excuse me spiritual connection or spiritual condition some of these some of these men that come that, that find themselves in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous actually ran towards that power rather than away from it, uh, and then of course took the wrong turn. They didn't surrender to the power when it came to the disease of alcoholism. They perhaps surrendered to the power in, in you know in other areas of their life. Uh, you know I'm I'm going on my own. By the time I'm 15 years old. And I'm in that Firebird with that junior girl head over to Greenville Avenue. I am entirely underneath my own power. Right. right. And so when you offer me a drink, I take the drink. But I have absolutely no idea what that drink is going to do for a guy like me. And I don't know whether it was the tail end of two or the beginning of three. But by the beginning of three... Tomorrow can be a million years away. And a guy like me needs tomorrow to be a million years away. Most importantly, at 15, it allowed me to repaint yesterday and make yesterday look exactly the way that I wanted it to look. Mm. And the average temperate drinker does not nor cannot have that type of experience. It is a spiritual experience. 
I hear you, Brett. In fact, uh, a, a gentleman that you sponsor who has been on this podcast before, Mr. Dave R. Oh, yeah. Um, he said to me when he was doing this podcast, in fact, and I've thought about it many times, uh, he said, uh, I don't know if I was born an alcoholic, but when I started to drink, an alcoholic was born, and I completely get that. Okay, we'll be continuing our conversation with Mr. Jimmy D in a moment. Just a reminder, you are listening to Sober Speak. You can find us at www.soberspeak.com. There you will find approximately, I don't know, 45, 50 other episodes, depending on when we publish this. But uh, you can also find the donate button on the website. Uh, if the spirit moves you to click on it, you can do such. SoberSpeak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. In fact, while I'm reading that, you know, I've always felt uncomfortable reading that. And this is just my uh, confession to you here while I'm sitting here with Jimmy D. And that is my sponsor keeps me straight on this. And just so you listeners know out there, I try to honor the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous and best I can. You know, I can promise you all out there, I will never, ever make a penny on this. This is f purely to try to uh, uh, help to break even. Um, and, you know, we use our first names only on here. Uh, we don't use images. Uh, you know, I'm probably not perfect at this. It's a new world we're living at he in here with, you know, podcasts and Skype meetings mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Right. We're all trying to do the best we can. But nonetheless, I want to get back to you. And so you're a Papagayo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not for long. <laughs> Maybe a couple of hours, <laughs> maybe three. You're discovering the solution. That's right. So to that's speak. right. So I, you know, I brown out, I black out, I pass out, I get sick. But it's magic. I mean, it's just absolute magic. So in the course of the next thirty days, I have a bootlegger, and we go out and get drunk on Friday nights. We a get bootlegger drunk on Saturday. Well, you had to have a bootlegger. Well, I say you had to. We had a senior girl at Woodrow okay, who had probably <laughs> failed a couple of grades. In fact, we need to preserve everyone's anonymity. But when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, my first sponsor, she had been an AA member for a little while, and he had dated her in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, this fine young woman who was willing to, uh, you know, help a brother out, right? <laughs> and uh, so for, we made orders on Tuesday. <laughs> she come to, she come to the horseshoe, which is where it all happened at Woodrow on Friday afternoon, pop the trunk, and, you know, you got a fifth of Bacardi or you got it, some gin or, you know, which back then was huge amounts. Of, it was, that was a lot of liquor. Otherwise, you were stuck with, you know, screw top Boone's Farm from that 7-Eleven at Hillside Village. You know, anybody, if you could walk, you could buy liquor there. But you couldn't get hard liquor, right? It was right. a little bit difficult. Um, I uh, haven't lived in, I live in Lake Islands. I'm living in Lakewood forever. But, you know, back Cornerstone, old Cornerstone, when I got sober, was on uh, Skillman and Mockingbird. Uh, they wrecked that building, but they were above the Cork and Bottle Liquor Store. They were on the second floor of a, stri a little strip center. Um, just down from where the intergroup office is now. Oh, okay. And, uh, and so there was a little strip center, maybe about a six or seven suite on each level strip center. And that cork and bottle liquor store, oh my God, was like one of my, you know, 10, you know, you have r the rounds of liquor right. stores. <laughs> I do, yeah. So there was an Asian family that ran that liquor store. Now I got, I got sober in 97, right? 1997. So in about. 2007 i was sober about 10 years and one of the girls that was a younger girl that we all you know kind of like our lakewood group she turned 45 years old we were having her 45th birthday we were going to campesi's for lunch so the first time she ever got drunk as with so many people she got drunk with me <laughs> and we got drunk on boone's farm screw top wine right <laughs> She had on, I remember she had a white sweater. She threw up tickle pink wine all over that white sweater. We <laughs> threw that sweater in the trunk of my car, and that car stunk like tickle pink wine <laughs> till I got rid of it. You just couldn't. I mean, that stuff was like, you know, 
cleaning fluid, <laughs> right? You couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> but anyway, the 7-Eleven that used to be at Abrams and Mockingbird, which is Hillside Village, no longer a 7-Eleven, but it's still a convenience store. So I thought, how funny. I'll take Darlene a bottle of screw top wine and a brown paper sack. It's her 45th birthday. You know, this is a woman with grown children. You know what I mean? She's a, she's a, and she's a pillar of her community. And I think I'll just, you know, say happy birthday to Darlene. Right. So she's not alcohol, not even close. And, um, so I went down there and bought this bottle of screw top wine, which even at the time, like this is what, 10, 11 years ago, it was still only like $2 and 15 cents. I mean, it's still like the cheapest, rot gut liquor ever right so i bought this bottle of wine i go up to the counter the woman starts ringing it up she looks up at me she stares at me for a second she says where you been and i said what do you mean where have i been and she said where you been i know you and i said i don't I don't live around here anymore. I haven't lived around here in years. And she said, no, we used to run Cork and Bottle Liquor Store. I know you. Where have you been? And I'm going to tell you, if a clerk hadn't seen your face in at least 12 years and still recognizes you, you probably ought to think about Alcoholics Anonymous. That's right. Right? So... <laughs> So anyway, they got me home in the new Firebird. You know, somebody drove me home. And uh, and we did the booth lo- bootlegger deal. And, you know, it was fun. It was fun. We went to the hill at White Rock Lake, which was over on the west side of the lake. You know, you had two or three little parking places over there where people hung out on the weekends. You took schnapps to the football game. You know, people drank. Uh, part of it might have been our era. I mean, you know, at the time in which we grew up. Uh, you know, if you went to a big dance, you went to progressive dinner parties and people drank. But I'm always, always the guy that ultimately somebody had to take care of. They either had to get me home or I had to spend the night at your house because they were afraid of me driving home. I mean, that started 15, 16 years of age, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, you know, nobody says at the time... But we had a thing called a senior publication. I rarely ever talk about this. I'm sure every school did something where it was kind of like the expose, right, about seniors, right? We actually published a little booklet. It uh, wasn't in the annual. It was a separate deal. You know, you had we call it the senior pub. And they'd been doing it at Woodrow since the 40s. I mean, it had been done and been done by the same faculty advisor since the 50s. But, you know, Woodrow is an ancient, ancient school, right? So um, and everything in that senior publication was about how much I drank. And you know, we went to Mexico, and I didn't draw sober breath. Or we went on spring break, and you know they wouldn't let me board the plane to come back home, and you know that kind of stuff. And uh, and you know, and then I I I, I uh, went to SMU on full academic scholarship. I was on a full academic scholarship to SMU um, for a year. Uh, until both my grades and the fact that I was selling research papers and I got caught um, busted me. And my grandmother that freshman year, when those articles, there was a woman named Molly Ivins, she's dead now, wrote for the Dallas Times Herald. And she interviewed us back then, and we, you know, there were 12 of us. And uh, this was right before Deadman had given SMU all the money, but there was an there was an endowment of sorts for this President's Scholars Program. You know, SMU was a little embarrassed by the Preppy Handbook deal, and that all it was ever known for was a drinking school, one of the top ten drinking schools in the United States of America, and the Board of Trustees wanted to change that, so they were really, really pushing academics. You know, uh, tenured professors, people that had some something going on, uh, rather than it, you know, it was still like a small town school. Um, so it was a big deal to get that scholarship money, and uh, and at the end of that first year, uh, you know, my grandmother did everything she could do and kept me in that university. Some of those trustees she had known, played cards with forty years, and she called every favor she had. And, uh, and so you, you know, the, the, you know, the, the consequences of taking actions based on self drunk or sober, Mm -hmm. you know, David Aronofsky used to say he's dead now a long Mm -hmm. time. I remember David, would say, 
The reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Doesn't have anything to do with AA, you know, or alcoholism or the disease of alcoholism. And, uh, and so, you know, it just got, it got a lot worse. I finished SMU, got a degree and got a DWI. I'm working for this little software company. And, you know, by the time I'm in my mid twenties, you know, I don't go to happy hour with them anymore because I've just made a, you know, just a total fool out of myself one too many times. Uh, you know, if I go to happy hour on Friday night, I don't come to work on Monday morning, you know, and I don't, I don't know. I still don't know that it's that first drink. And for a guy like me taking that first drink that I have absolutely no control over where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do. And then I'm not going to stop until I get stopped. Something stops me. My health is deteriorating and my world is small. So, you know, in the beginning of our, of our talk today, you know, maladjusted to life or, or, you know, socially uncomfortable, you know, liquor certainly was a social lubricant for me, but, uh, you know, it turned on me at some point years before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and not so much that every time I drank, I went to jail or every time I drank, you know, something happened to my car or every time I drank, you know, I had an argument with a lifelong friend, which closed the friendship forever. Sometimes those things happened. Uh, but more often than not, I just remember I could sit in a room of four or 500 people sometimes whom I'd known all my life and just felt like the most lonely person on the planet. Lonely. You know, and I thought the drinking was supposed to alleviate that. And, uh... All right. So listen, Jimmy D, uh, this has been a great uh, first session. I'm, you know, we're uh, we're kind of tapping the, the surface of your story. OK, and I want to bring you back for another session at some other time. OK. Sure. So we can pr finish up your story. Uh, this has been great. Uh, a lot of good information. And so I'm going to make a, this is the first time I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a, a series, so to speak, huh? <laughs> like, like Netflix, okay? Right, right, right. And so uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and close this one up here by reading from page 164 of the big book. And uh, here in our big book, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says on page 164, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. And we're going to have Jimmy back next week. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you.